we're going to get started. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Tyler Kelly and I serve as the Senior Associate Director of Recruitment and Student Services for the Hamilton Luger School. And we are very excited to share with you a little bit more about what the student experience is like at the Hamilton Luger School and more specifically at IU. And so today we're going to focus on a bunch of different things ranging from student life to residence halls, where to live, should you bring your car, um, many of the questions that you and your parents are probably wondering right now. And so I'm going to make a few notes so you all know how this is going to go. You all may see me refer to my phone because this is where my notes are. Um, but with us today we have several student ambassadors who are going to share their experiences. I'll have them introduce themselves a little bit later. Off screen, we have Sarah Edwards, who serves as the Associate Director of Recruitment and Student Services for the Hamilton Luger School. And she is off screen and she'll be replying to your um, questions and helping to guide our conversations on the back end of things. I like to note that should you all have any questions, please use the question and answer section to submit those questions. And I always like to make a general, general rule that we can't complete the session unless you all have asked at least three questions. And so um, we will be looking forward to hearing your questions. If you write in the chat, just keep in mind that we could miss your question. So please do use the question and answer section for your questions. And so without further ado, I'm going to have our student ambassadors introduce themselves. And actually, I lied. I have a few updates for you all. So let me provide those for you first. So first, you all may have heard, but IU has extended its enrollment deadline to June 1st. So you all have now until June 1st to make a decision. We recognize that we are dealing with unprecedented times and um, there's just so much on the table. And so we want to make sure that you all have the opportunity to do the research that you need to do um, to make all the connections that you need to make in order to make um, the right decision for you. Um, also, you will note that new student orientation has moved to being online. So it will not be an in-person experience, um, though they are working very hard to make it an experience that is very similar to the in-person experience. And so, um, we're excited to still provide opportunities for students to connect with one another. You also have your academic advising session, et cetera. And then in terms of housing, you have um, until June 1st to um, submit your housing application, but do keep in mind that if you wanna change your preferences listed within your application, you need to do so by May 11th. And so should you have questions about any of those particular entities, you are more than welcome to reach out to us and we will help to get you in co contact with the appropriate people. So now without further ado, I'm gonna have our student ambassadors introduce themselves and we'll go right in order. order. So Kiara, if you wanna start us off. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kiara Fight. I am a senior studying international studies with minors in business and Spanish and a certificate in Latin American and Caribbean studies. Um, and I'm originally from Jakarta, Indonesia. Hi guys, my name is Mackenzie Knight. I am a junior. Um, I'm from Westfield, Indiana, and I am studying Near Eastern Languages and Cultures with the Arabic track and then double majoring in an individualized major called Policy and Intelligence Analysis with a minor in Spanish. Apologies. Hello everybody. My name is John Patterson. I'm from the DC area, majoring in international studies, minoring in intelligence studies through uh, SAIS, School of Informatics, and also minoring in Russian through HLS. Hi everybody, I'm Katie Raddy. I am a sophomore at IU and I'm from South Bend, Indiana, and I'm studying political science, international studies, and Spanish. So as you all can see, and I say this literally every time I present with students, our students come from a wide variety of interests and backgrounds. And so um, that is truly something that I appreciate about the Hamilton Luger School, that it allows students to um, pursue interests in many different fields and still graduate in four years. Um, so for our panelists, I have a, a really big question for you before we get started. Where is your favorite place to eat in Bloomington? It was Darn Good Soup, which has unfortunately closed recently. Um, but the uh, close second would be Siam House. Yeah, I was gonna say my top two are Siam House um, and then also Ami, which is a sushi place. Yeah, um, I agree with Mackenzie as well. Ami is probably one of my favorite and then also Taste of India. I'll be honest, Buffalo is just my favorite. Perfect, John. I was hoping that someone would say that. That's actually my favorite as well. So if you all oh, want yeah. wings, Buffalo is the place to go. Although we do have a Buffalo Wild Wings in Bloomington, I think Buffalo is a little bit better. 
Yep, hometown IU feel, just off campus. So you can walk. It's not even a five-minute walk if you're on campus. And not too spicy, though I do enjoy spicy food. Yeah, yep. my general Bloomington food take is you never have an excuse to eat at a chain. You can <laughs> if you want, but, but you never, in my opinion, you, you shouldn't. So <laughs> There's always a better agreed. local restaurant. Agreed. Awesome. Well, let's jump in. And we're going to start off with res life or dorm life, as some would call it. And so um, thinking back on your freshman year, thinking about as you made a college decision, as you kind of thought through where you wanted to live, um, give us a kind of perspective as to where you chose to live um, and what that experience was like. And not all of you have to respond, but if you all want to give a few different um, experiences that you all had. Um, I'll go first for this one. Um, so I chose to live in the central neighborhood. Um, and I'll, I just saw that somebody asked what neighborhood would be best to put down if you're planning to take classes at HLS. Um, and so that was actually kind of my exact thinking. Um, because of the location of the um, Global and International Studies building, the central neighborhood is the closest. Um, and so I wanted to live central just so that I would be in, you know, a pretty equal walking distance to everything. Um, the HLS LLC didn't, you know, exist when I was an incoming freshman. Um, so I went with um, putting an outdoor adventure floor as my top choice, which is basically just a type of floor, um, like living learning community where you go on different outdoor trips like camping or skiing or hiking and things like that. So I wanted to do something that had some fun options like that. Um, and so, yeah, I lived in a dorm called Teeter. Yeah, um, I lived in the first cohort of the HLS LLC. Um, so I was one of the guinea pigs and um, I did get into my first choice. Uh, I loved it there. I know some people I've talked to at different, um, when we were still having live info sessions and at different times are concerned that, um, you know, if they were to live there and another sort of LLC that they would sort of be cloistered into one group of students, but I, that was not my experience at all. I'm really close friends with a lot of the people that live there, um, and it was a really great community to live in, um, and it was nice to know people right off the bat, and it was sort of, um, our friendships were kind of facilitated by living in an LLC, but I definitely, um, you know, in the organizations I got involved in and different things, I definitely didn't feel um, suffocated. So if you have the opportunity to live in an LLC, um, I would highly recommend that, um, and the HLS LLC is housed in Spruce Hall, which is in the Southeast neighborhood, which is slightly farther walk than what McKinsey was talking about, but um, not bad at all from HLS. Thank you all for sharing. Um, talk to us about um, if you think that it's important to um, choose a residence hall by thinking about if there will be other HLS students there. Do you think that it makes a difference based on your experience? Um, you know, tell us about what that was like for you. Um, I think for me, in terms of like choosing a residence hall, I always look for like the most important thing. So proximity. So like where I think my classes are going to be um, in terms of like walking distance, if it's like a central location or if it's a lot further out. Um, and then also it's like proximity to food, because I think like when it's the winter time, especially, it's like a lot easier to have like a dorm that has some food in it or like a dining hall or a sea store instead of like one that you have to like walk a little bit to get to. Yeah. So Kiara, on, on that note, um, where would you say is the best um, campus restaurant? Um, my personal favorite is Forest Dining Hall. So they have the Woodlands, um, just because they have like a variety of different types of food. Um, they have a really good smoothie place. Um, and I think it's like, in terms of quality of food, it's probably the best on campus as well. What about you others? Have you all eaten on, of course you've eaten on campus. Where, where's your favorite place to eat on campus? Forest is also my favorite. I, the HLS LLC is actually right across the street. It's le like literally less than a minute walk from Forest. So I ate there constantly. Um, and there's, uh, it has a wide variety of food. And in my opinion, it has the most um, like healthy options. Uh, and you don't really, um, it's harder to find those options at some other dining halls, in my opinion. John, what about you? Uh, in my case, I normally was in an apartment, so I had my own food, but I appreciated the uh, coffee shop in the basement of the 
Wells Library because that was the quickest access if you're in HLS, you want a quick coffee, which a lot of late nights trying to study <laughs> or early mornings, need coffee, maybe breakfast. Uh, it was always really helpful just being able to go out the building, brisk walk, go grab breakfast, coffee, and then go back to class in the building. So that was my personal favorite. Yeah. And John, tell us a little about your background. So you kind of come from a different background than most of the panelists. And so kind of on that to the question of, um, you know, was it hard making friends if you didn't live with other HLS students or is it absolutely necessary that you live with HLS students, et cetera? Talk us through what your experience was like um, kind of having a non-traditional path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so quick background. I transferred to IU after my freshman year. For my freshman year, I went to IUPUI, so it's Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. I uh, learned about HLS and the programs there, specifically about the Russian language program, which is what I originally wanted to study. So I decided to transfer, came over, and I stayed in one of the apartment complexes on the north side of campus. So it was different than the typical path, but I personally liked it because I've been more reserved, like to have my space, being able to have quick access to the gym. I'm also part of the ROTC program, so having access to the SRSC um, was really nice, as well as being able to um, have access to the e-bus, which the e-bus is the, one of the best buses because it goes all the way around campus for every single section. So if you, even if you don't live at the apartment complex I was in was called uh, Everman, but even if you don't live in that apartment complex, you're still going to use e-bus because it's the most complete route around campus. But um, back to your question. Uh, I think food wise, housing wise, but then also with students, it's, Honestly, you really don't need to worry about that because everybody has to go through the same beginning classes. Everybody, normally you start getting, because if you're an international studies student, you have to have a language that you take. Uh, normally you begin to get familiar with the people who are in that language course in 101 and then 102. You're all suffering together, trying to learn the basics, learning the grammar, learning, learning the vocabulary. So you normally develop the community even if you don't live together just because you work together because you're all working on the same languages or you're working in the same um, extracurricular program within HLS or student organizations. There's a lot of different things that you develop a community and then sure, you, that's normally how you decide where to live afterwards because you realize, hey, would you wanna be roommates together next year? Or would you wanna be uh, dorm mates next year? Because you find people that you connect with in your freshman year with everybody having to take the same classes. So early on, it can be worrisome, but that's the other part of college. You just, you learn how to develop connections and talk with people. So it becomes easier to do it the more you're in college. And John, we actually have a question for you. And so that question is, um, where's the best neighborhood to live in if you're a part of ROTC in terms of balancing it between the Hamilton Luber School and ROTC? Hmm, oh man. Um, to balance between those, that would probably be South, what is it, Central and or South East neighborhood, I think is what it, it's like dots across it, yeah. because uh, the ROTC building, again, if you have any ROTC questions, I can answer those. Uh, the ROTC building is on the South side of campus, on the very edge. Um, after your freshman year, you would need a vehicle. Uh, it's difficult not being able to have a vehicle just because of how many events that we have for ROTC, you have to attend a lot. We can offer rides, but it's expected that uh, as you continue in your career, you'll be able to develop more independence and being able to help support uh, the underclassmen once you become a junior and a senior. But that's for ROTC, that's not HLS specific. But again, I would say central neighborhood or southeast neighborhood, and that's on-campus housing. There's a lot of off-campus housing to the south of campus, that if you wanted to order, or not order, if you wanted to um, rent an apartment, normally you can do that. And normally uh, cadets after their freshman year would rent an apartment with other cadets. Like there are several people in my class who are also ROTC cadets who do, are doing that right now. They're all on the same contract in a house just around the area. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I have a couple other questions for any of you. Uh, Kiara, I want you to definitely talk to uh, talk um, to this point, but any one of you could also answer. So for those students who, um, and, and Kiara, I say you because you're a resident assistant. Um, and so for, for those students who, let's say, don't get their first choice or 
um, they don't get into a living learning center for, that they chose, um, what piece of advice or encouragement would you all provide to them um, as they, you know, navigate their first year? And John alluded to some of those things, but from your experience or maybe your friend's experience, um, what would you say? What would you say? Um, so I am a resident assistant in Wright Quad, which is like one of the name or the dorms in the central neighborhood. Um, it's not usually anyone's first choice, um, but a lot of people do live there because it's a really big residence halls. Um, and in terms of just finding things, because it's such a big residence hall, I find that a lot of like my residents especially have been able to make friends with each other if they like leave their doors open or if they go to community events um, with each other as like a resident assistant as well. Um, part of our job is to become a resource for residents and especially this year with like the new residential curriculum we've been trying to get our students connected with the campus more so we've been taking our residents to events promoting different events on campus and there's different things through like the office of first year experience like who's your experience that encourages um, first year students to go to different events on campus and these are for all floors right so not just living learning centers yeah, so it can be for anyone who lives on campus, anybody who lives off campus, anyone who's basically a student at IU. Thank you. Um, and so talk to us a little bit more about that and any panelists can answer that. Um, one of the questions in, a, in the question and answer section is, um, what are some of the activities that you could participate in an LLC, um, but also maybe if you didn't participate in living in an LLC, but there were still opportunities that existed within your residential option, talk a little bit about what those things could look like. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit about what an LLC might host. So um, I lived in the HLS LLC in the first year. So in, um, in my cohort, we didn't really have any trips or um, bigger activities that first semester, but we had a lot of dinners, we would have speakers come in. Um, Congressman Lee Hamilton, who is one of our um, namesakes actually came in and had dinner with us in the LLC once and which was really great. Um, so we had a lot of dinners and those kinds of um, community building events in the first semester, which um, I think made us really close friends for the most part um, and were and were really great. And then in the second semester, we took a trip to Chattanooga, Tennessee and went whitewater rafting, um, which was we paid. Um, I'm not sure exactly how much, but just it was a pretty nominal fee and it covered um, hotel and things like that. And I know they're planning some bigger trips um, possibly for the future. So I know the HLS LLC has that kind of thing on the docket. Um, I know uh, I know McKinsey mentioned being in the outdoor LLC, which they do um, trips like that as well. Um, so I know LLCs, it'll depend on thematically what the LLC is, what the um, activities will be, but you can kind of um, expect that there will be different community building and maybe sort of trip um, events that are thematically related to whatever your, your LLC is. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So my next question, as we kind of begin to transition away from the topic of first year living, um, the, the, the last question in this section is, um, what advice would you have for move-in day? Avoid Target, Walmart, <laughs> whatever at all costs for move-in day the next day will be fine you'll probably survive without that shampoo yeah I would say like plan on bringing everything you're going to need don't plan on saying like oh I'll just run to Target when I get there for the things I still need definitely bring everything because Target gets so picked over um, that there will probably be nothing left by the time you try to go um, if there's still an option for early move-in you should definitely do that um, because usually you can sign up for early move-in, which just means you move in like a couple days before the main move-in day. And it just means that there's way less people there um, and you can kind of get settled and then on move-in day be focused on, you know, meeting and greeting a bunch of different people. Um, I'd also say if you plan on like hanging up a lot of stuff, bring as many of those like um, Velcro adhesive things that you can and little hooks and stuff like that because that's something that so many people forget and then decide to run to Target for but they're always out. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, move in can be really hectic, but it is so much fun. And so um, you all will get to get you'll feel all the feelings. Um, so kind of moving on to um, the next set of questions. We're going to talk about kind of life and living and housing outside of the freshman year or outside of the first year. And so, um, you know, if you all don't mind sharing a few of you um, kind of talk about a little bit about where you live now, how you made that decision and how that maybe impacts your um, 
daily life, your plans, your study habits, those kinds of things. So I still lived on campus, not in a dorm, um, but I lived in an on-campus apartment. Um, and so I was still on campus, still could walk pretty much everywhere, but I live alone. Um, I didn't have a roommate when I was still on campus, um, when we were still having face-to-face -face classes. And I personally, that was really good for me. Um, I, was, I was more productive because I was so close with so many people in my dorm that it was easier to just sort of um, hang out with friends where um, it, it was easier for me to sort of manage my time in that, in the living situation I had this year. Um, I did have a car on campus um, this year, even though I didn't on campus my freshman year and did not feel that I needed it at all. But now that um, I wasn't in the dorm and wasn't, you know, eating in the dining halls as often, it was nice just for the grocery store, but I really didn't use my car other than that once a week grocery trip. That's a good point about cars too. So for those of you interested in bringing cars, you are, as of, at least as of last year, you were allowed to bring um, your car your freshman year, but you are required to park it at the um, stadium and you have to move it from the stadium on the weekends, typically to your residence hall. And you also have to apply for a parking permit. So um, we typically advise if you don't absolutely need it, you know, you really could get by, especially living on campus without it. Um, but you are allowed to bring it technically should you get approved to do so. Mackenzie, did you want to add anything about, um, you know, where you live now that you're, you know, kind of, kind of gone past freshman year and what that experience has been like for you? Yeah, um, so I live off campus in a house. Um, I am, I was sort of in a good situation. My, my sister is also a student at, at IU. So we moved into a house together with two other roommates. So I live with my sister and two other people. Um, and so honestly, the best way that people find roommates um, for off-campus living is just, you know, by the time that you've gone through freshman year um, and you've gotten involved in a few other things, we were able to connect with another girl. My sister and I both did um, dance marathon. Um, we were on a committee for that and we connected with a girl who was on our same dance marathon committee and we all decided to um, rent a house together. Um, and you coming I mean, on all of the different rental websites or even just like driving around Bloomington, it's super easy, um, especially towards the end of the year um, to find a bunch of houses or apartments that are available for rent for the next year and kind of um, just take advantage of those opportunities that we went on several different tours um, before we're landing on which one to choose. Um, but I, that's, it's something that I don't think that it stresses a lot of people out, but I don't think it's something that you should really worry about that much um, because there's always going to be somewhere um, there's always going to be an option and um, I would say just start thinking about it earlier rather than later um, because people do kind of start looking at renting houses and apartments um, by like the beginning of spring semester and so you kind of want to make sure that you're jumping on that. Yeah that's a really good point. Um, for me personally I graduated from IU as well and I lived on campus until um, until senior year so senior year I finally moved off because I wanted to practice cooking. And so um, you see a variety of students doing different things. You'll see people living on campus all four years. Some students will live on campus for one year. Um, it really does vary. It's all about per personal preference. Um, I would say the biggest piece of advice that I would give to students is that you got to know yourself, right? So if you're um, not the most focused person, if you get distracted really easily, or, you know, um, not always the most motivated, then living off campus could potentially be a distraction. Um, because you're a little bit away from your resources. I know for me personally, it was very difficult to ever do homework in my room, whether I lived on campus or not. And so when you don't have access to a library right close to you, that could be a challenge. Um, and so to that end, we have a, a question about um, where are the best places to study? So um, from an academic standpoint, where have you all kind of found your home for study time? I spend a lot of time um, in the East Tower of Wells Library. Um, just because it's quiet and um, like you have sort of personal space and you have space to, I'm in some, um, I'm in the political analytics workshop in the political science major. So I have some statistics classes and you sort of need space for your textbooks and like space to spread out, which um, I have trouble focusing in my room, but I also like don't really have the space to do that. So Wells has a lot of really good resources for that. Um, I also like for sort of social studying, I've, um, uh, spend a lot of time at different coffee shops. So the Poor House and the Soma on Third Street. Um, and then just to address another question that was about the difference between on campus 
and off-campus apartments. I think one big difference is what Tyler mentioned about just like being able to easily get to those study spaces on campus um, and, and or like near campus. Um, and then another difference is just um, if you have a, you know, real landlord versus IU being your landlord. Um, so like I pay my rent through the bursar. Um, and then the other last difference that I feel is important to point out is that um, you sort of have to make your decision earlier for on-campus apartments. So I signed my lease for my on-campus apartment the um, middle of October of my freshman year, where my friends who lived off-campus didn't sign their leases um, until about like February were sort of the earliest off-campus leases that I remember my friends signing. So um, if you're thinking that's an option you want to look at, that's a sort of a decision you'd want to make early in, early in the year. Thank you. I have another question that's in the chat that I think is somewhat relevant to bring up now. Um, and I know, John, I definitely want you to touch on this, um, but anyone else can join in as well. Um, how did you all, how long did it take for you to get confident in navigating campus, um, making your way around campus from a transportation standpoint, but then also just from a um, emotional standpoint, how long did it take and what are some things that you all did to um, kind of get yourself acquainted with everything, get comfortable, get settled in? <laughs> that is a really good question. And I'll be honest, you drop me in the middle of uh, central neighborhood, I will still get lost. <laughs> like, not even kidding. The first day I was on campus, I got so lost. It was, and it, I was with my family and we had a map and we were still lost. <laughs> but it takes several months once you get used to it. And the thing is, it really depends on where your classes are because I had several classes in Valentine Hall, uh, several classes in HLS, and then I had some in, oh, the building name is escaping me. Basically, I had classes spread all over campus. And because of that, it kind of forces you to learn where it is. There's a helpful map on one.iu. Once you get your login information, you can go in and it's an interactive map where you can go through and look, search for every single building using the building codes. So when you look up your classes, you have the building name and the building code with the, with the room number. You can go onto the site, look up where that building is, and it'll show you exactly where it is on campus on the campus map. And when you do your new student orientation, normally they would give you a paper map, but I'm pretty sure they'll give you like an electronic copy. Print that out and carry it with you. I know it sounds weird, kind of like, oh, we're going exploring, okay. But it's very helpful having the quick reference to be able to pull out the map, say, okay, this building looks like that one, this building looks like that one, it must be roughly here. And even being able to just go up to a student and saying, hey, I'm sorry, how, where do I go? I'm lost. The, having the map there will be really helpful for them to be able to point you in the right direction of where to go, instead of just having to punch it into a GPS or trying to figure out, okay, you go down that road to the corner, take a left and do that. So it's, help, it's helpful to have the map, but it does take time. And being patient with yourself, that's, it all, all works together. John, that's great advice. I was kind of laughing in my head because I wonder if that whole map thing um, kind of goes back to the fact that you're an ROTC and you know how to actually use a map. Because I'm thinking from my experience, like <laughs> I probably would get extra lost trying to use a map rather than using a GPS. Yeah, and if I can, if I can chime in real quick, I, I think this is another situation where you sort of need to know yourself because it took me about a day and a half to be able to get pretty much anywhere on campus um, and about a week to know the best routes everywhere. Um, but also, if you asked me to use a paper map, it would not be useful to me at all. Um, I would say if you're like me and a paper map would not be useful to you and you're using your phone's GPS, what I would recommend is it's going to take you um, on, on the streets. Uh, so like, which, which will get you there, but it's not going to be the most efficient route. So my pro tip for sort of learning campus would be to use your like phone's GPS but to follow yourself like on the blue dot and sort of like hypotenuse yourself between places instead of following the way it tells you to go. Um, but then you have the GPS like following yourself as a dot um, to make sure you're sort of on the right track. Um, but I think, you know, if you're um, like me at least and you're exploring campus and um, sort of, I don't know, spatially aware, um, it, it just depends on who you are, I guess, but I, it, it didn't take me very long to learn the campus by doing the, the GPS route. Mm -hmm. Another yeah, nugget that I, sorry, go, go, go ahead. 
Um, I kind of want to um, emphasize what Katie said because similar to her, like it did, actually didn't take me very long to figure out campus, um, especially because the first couple weeks that you're there, you are not going to want to be sitting in your dorm, like doing nothing. You're going to be out and about all the time and you're going to be walking all over campus, going to different events and stuff. So you're just kind of naturally going to learn the campus in the first week or two that you're there. Um, and the most important thing is just like, I would suggest learn the major buildings first, you know, make sure you know where Wells is, the library. Make sure you know where Ballantyne Hall is or where the Indiana Memorial Union is. And once you learn kind of the big landmarks, then when you're asking people like, hey, where's Sycamore Hall or something? And they say, oh, it's, you know, by Jordan Hall, but you have to go behind. Then you're kind of like, okay, well, what if I don't even know where Jordan Hall is? So just kind of learn the major ones first and you're, you'll hear people talking about them all the time and try to get those acquainted in your mind about where they are because that'll help you. People are almost always going to reference other buildings when telling you where something is. Kiara, did you want to add something? Um, yeah, I think the easiest, I think it took me maybe like a week or two to get acquainted with campus. Um, what helped was that I did move in earlier um, and me and like someone I met during orientation who's now my best friend, we were like, okay, we're gonna figure out this campus within like a couple of days. So we spent the first few days, one, walking our class schedule and making sure we knew like the exact pattern and like actually going inside the building and finding the classroom so we weren't lost on that first day. And then other things we did was we remembered different um, things that they said during orientation. So like cultural centers, um, they were all open during that first week before like classes started. So we went in, introduced ourselves, um, found these different resources and made those connections early on. So we knew like, oh, these cultural centers would have these different events or like this is where our classes are gonna, we're gonna be. Thank you all for sharing. So I was like John in that it did take me a while to learn all of campus. It, it was very quick to learn where my classes were, but IU can be big and it can be daunting. And so um, moving in early, having a friend to explore with, and also like John mentioned too, giving yourself a little bit of grace and patience because um, there are probably still buildings on campus that I am unfamiliar where they are, um, but I also never need to go there. So. Um, it just depends, but thank you all for sharing your perspective, um, your perspectives on kind of how you navigated campus. Um, moving to our next section, let's highlight student organizations. So um, what student orgs have you been a part of at IU? Um, and talk to us a little bit about, you know, one or two that get you really excited and how you've been able to personally make an impact through that student organization, club, um, or however you find yourself involved on campus. Yeah, so, um I am involved in a few student organizations, but I see a question um, in the Q&A about Model UN, um, and that's sort of the club that I devote most of my time to, so I'll just talk about that. Um, so I'm in Model UN. I've traveled a couple of times with, um, uh, with Model UN, so I've gone to a conference last fall in Boston and then one in Philadelphia. Um, there was one in Chicago that was supposed to be this semester, but we'll go next year. Um, and so also we, so we travel um, there's always like member education is most of our meetings. So most of our meetings are about, here's how you draft a general assembly resolution or here's how you draft crisis notes and um, different things like that and public speaking. Um, I think one of the biggest things I've definitely gotten out of Model UN is sort of extemporaneously giving speeches and stuff like that. It's done a lot for my public speaking. Um, and then we also host a conference for high school students in the spring. So that's a big part of what we do as well if you're not as interested in traveling. Um, last year, I was a crisis director, which if you're already familiar with High School Model UN, which I was not, that essentially just means that I wrote and directed a crisis committee. Um, so I responded to all the notes and I crafted the updates and sort of directed what happened um, in the front room, um, which was a lot of fun. I got to sort of, um, our topic was the Chilean national plebiscite of 1988, which is something I care a lot about and a lot of people don't know about. So it was fun to sort of um, use that opportunity to teach people about something I care about and watch them sort of have a fun time um, sort of experiencing and learning that part of history that they hadn't encountered before. Um, so if you're interested in Model UN, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any more questions you all have. And we can hear from everyone for this question. Um, I'll go next for this one. So I am a part of um, Union Board, which um, so there's the Union Building on campus, the Indiana Memorial Union. And so Union Board is kind of like the governing 
and programming body of the union. Um, and so our main role is we program like most of the events that happen on campus. Um, so specifically, I'm the director of the lectures committee. So I bring speakers to campus. Um, so for example, my committee brought um, Anderson Cooper during this past fall. Um, and we've brought um, Terry Cruz and Josh Peck. Um, we do smaller scale and larger scale lectures. Um, larger scale ones are, you know, at the IU Auditorium. So we bring some really cool people. Um, and sometimes it'll be a lecture that's, um, you know, really educational and about something super important. And sometimes it's just for fun. Like Josh Peck was just kind of like a comedy show, honestly. Um, so it's super fun. And there's a bunch of different committees on Union Board as well. So like I said, I do lectures, but there's also concerts and they're the ones who put on like our big block party during welcome week and the little five concert um and there's the comedy committee social impact um canvas which is like the art committee so pretty much any interest you have like union board is a great place to get involved and to help put on programs for other students um, um, I realized I said Little Five concert and everybody might not know what that is. So I'm just going to kind of explain that real quick. So Little Five, short for Little 500, is our famous bike race that happens in April every year. Unfortunately, got canceled this year, obviously. Um, but it's kind of the biggest event that happens at IU every year. People come from like other universities in Indiana, sometimes even in neighboring states, to come visit their friends for Little Five. Um, it can turn into a bit of a party, but it's mostly just kind of an opportunity like there's so many events around campus during Little Five. Um, like I said, the huge concert and there's just lots of stuff to do that whole week. Um, so it's a it's a great event that happens in April. So yeah, Union Board is a really great opportunity. It's also um, just really amazing for building professional skills because I have to work with agents myself to kind of book these professionals who I'm bringing to campus. So I have to work with budget and I have to work with negotiating um, and just kind of having professional phone calls and things like that. Um, so it's a good option. Um, and then also I was on IU Dance Marathon, which is a really huge thing that I know a lot of high schools in Indiana do as well, which is basically just um, also different committees you can be a part of. But Dance Marathon is one huge event where we stay up for 36 hours straight. Um, and we just dance and have fun and raise money for Riley Hospital for Children. So those are the two main ones that I'm involved in. So for me, um, I was uh, um, participated in a service fraternity called Alpha Phi Omega, and they did a bunch of service both on campus and off campus. Um, it was a co-ed fraternity, so it was both um, male and females, and we would just either host big events on campus or work with different um, local communities here in Bloomington and make sure that we were able to do service. Um, another thing I was a part of was O Team, which is the orientation team. Um, and I did that for two years. So I did the first year serving as an orientation leader. So directly helping with um, incoming students and guests, um, doing presentations, um, doing the campus tour at night, um, facilitating those connections. And then the second year I was a student coordinator so doing all the mentoring, training, the hiring of the orientation leaders for an entire school year, as well as um, doing things professionally to help me grow, like going to an orientation conference. Um, and it was also a very good thing because it was something that was paid as well and a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. So in my case, it's the answer for most of these, things, these questions will be ROTC. I'm specifically part of the Army ROTC program. I also did the Russian flagship uh, because I found out I was not able to continue with the program uh, for the capstone year, but it's long history, wasn't able to join in time because it opened up two years ago. So all of you will be able to join it this coming, this coming fall and be able to continue the program completely. So if you have any questions about that, specifically the Russian flagship, happy to answer those. Um, primary organization that I was a part of took most of my time and that I absolutely love and now they're trying to give me a job. <laughs> COVID-19 put a damper on that right now, but uh, it's in the process. So with our Army ROTC, uh, it's primarily a leadership training focus for the first two years. Take a class, you participate in physical fitness training three days a week, and then uh, we have labs normally every Thursday. Schedule can change, but so far this is the schedule that we're keeping. 
Um, you get instruction in small unit tactics, leadership, uh, making leadership decisions in stressful situations, and just learning how to work with people when you're tired, when you're hungry, uh, when you don't know all of the information, but you got to make a decision. Uh, it's really, really helpful for just developing self-confidence, figuring out maybe I want to go military, maybe I want to go something a bit more hands-on. Um, and then later into the program, as a junior and senior, you begin learning specific uh, Army um, tasks of how to be an officer, how to uh, lead your soldiers under your command, whether that be in a platoon, a infantry platoon, uh, armor, artillery, or all the way up to like military intelligence, military police, signal corps, stuff like that. And then fourth year is when you actually work with your fellow classmates to run the battalion and are actually directing events. You're in charge of planning. Uh, we have cadre, so that's active duty army personnel who help us and guide us. But we, the cadets, functionally run the battalions. We're coming up with uh, the curriculum, with the events. We're manning it. We're uh, directing the training and supplying it, figuring out what we need, ordering it, making sure everything's ready to go for it. So, and after all of that, you eventually commission. And then once you commission, you go into the Army as a second lieutenant. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks for sharing, everyone. So I have a couple questions for any of you to answer. Um, one is, do you all know of anyone who um, maybe have partic has participated in a club sport or did you participate in club sport? Another question I have, so I, got th I have three questions and any of you can answer them. So club sports, anything about them that you may know? Number two is, um, how easy is it to start a student organization on campus? And three, um, how do students learn about these student organizations to get involved in? Any student organization that is. Yeah, so to speak to that last question, um, uh, the way I found out about most of the clubs I'm involved in are from friends and my RA um, in the LLC I lived in. But um, I know another really common way is to go, there's at the beginning of every um, school year, there's a, uh, I wish I could remember what it was called right now, but it's like a club's fair essentially. And it's, if it's a nice day, it's on Dun Meadow. If not, it's inside the Memorial Union um, and representatives from a bunch of student organizations will be there to tell you about their um, organization. Yeah, there's also, I mean, you'll see in every single building you walk into or just walking around campus, there are flyers everywhere on like every single surface all the time um, that different organizations and clubs post for their events or their call out meetings. Um, and so a really easy way is just to walk through buildings and look at their, you know, cork boards and all of the flyers that are posted on them and see if there's anything that really interests you. Um, if you haven't visited uh, the Global and International Studies building yet, we also have different boards all over with different flyers on them and also the elevators themselves um, on the inside are covered in flyers for different organizations and clubs. Um, and so you might see some there that are more specific to your interests um, for clubs that a lot of HLS students are in. So that's a really good way. Um, and as for starting your own club, it's super easy. Um, I know several people who have done it. Um, I believe you have to find like a faculty member to um, kind of like sponsor it or be like a faculty um, advisor. Faculty staff, yeah. yeah. Um, and you kind of just go through Be Involved, which is like a website that we all use um, that has all of the um, clubs and organizations that exist at IU listed on it. So over like 700 of them, I don't even know. Um, and so if you go to beinvolved.indiana.edu, um, you can create your club through there or start like the application or whatever, um, and also just see all of the different clubs. And then I can take the question about club sports too. So in terms of club sports, there are many ways to learn about them. One is simply going to the SRSC or the Wildermere and Mural Center. That's where you can learn about them. They are walk-on, so any student can participate in club sports. Um, and we have a wide variety of them. Um, we even have, um, what is it called, um, Battleship. And so if you wanna do Battleship where you get in a boat on, in a pool with some teammates and try to sink the other team's boat, um, that is an option here at IU. So a lot to do. Um, and then I also saw another question that asked about um, students who may be interested in the performing arts or music um, and specifically what those opportunities look like. Are students in HLS interested in those opportunities, specifically the OLC students 
um, um, or beyond. And so if you all have any experience with that or have peers in HLS that have participated in musical events and or attended, feel free to share. Yeah, so I lived in the LLC. I personally um, was not um, interested in performing, uh, but I, there were a couple of my close friends in the LLC that were a member that were members of the concert orchestra. So they weren't Jacobs majors, but they had tried out and they were um, both in that orchestra. So they um, would, they and others would, uh, they would perform and we would go watch them. So a group from the LLC would love to go see the performances they were in. And then there were a bunch of people who um, went and saw other Jacobs performances as well. So the LLC um, and HLS in general does have a lot of people who are interested both in performing itself and in um, attending Jacobs performances. Yeah, and most of them are free. So students from any background can just go and attend most of the events. There's also, if you wanna go see some like professional shows that are also, um, a lot of Jacobs students are involved in them as well. Sometimes they are Jacobs um, School Productions, but the Musical Arts Center um, puts on operas all the time. Um, and the Musical Arts Center is beautiful on the inside. It's like tiered balconies um, and it's gorgeous. And tickets to go to those operas are usually like $5. Um, and so I definitely recommend doing that at least once because it's a really fun opportunity just like with your friends to get all dressed up and go to the opera, but it's on campus. Um, so that's really fun. And then the IU Auditorium brings musicals all the time too, which do tend to be a little more expensive, but like we just had um, Les Miserables and that was, I think tickets were like 10 or $15. Um, so it's not too bad. And those are always really cool to go see as well. Yeah, yeah. and just a quick point about the LLC. Um, if you, for whoever asked about the LLC and Jacobs, um, all the Jacobs buildings are like a five minute walk away from the LLC. So um, it was, you know, that we'd get a whole group of us and could just, it was like a 10 minute there and back walk. Um, so geographically, that's kind of nice too. Yeah, and the one thing I'll kind of reiterate is that there's so much to get involved in, so it can be very overwhelming. Um, and so just make sure that you kind of explore what your interests are, you know, take your time, don't try to do, you know, five or six things at once, but choose a couple things to do and then, you know, switch out as you see fit. Um, but yes, IU has over 750. When I was a student at IU, I was involved in a historically black fraternity, um, a Christian ministry on campus geared towards African-American students. Um, I was a researcher. I did um, research for the social psychology department. Um, and so I share that because there is a wide variety of things, um, regardless of what you're interested in. You all may have heard if you attended IU or um, visited IU before that there was a leaf raking club before and a sweet potato club. And, and being on a meeting call with these students on this panel right now and their colleague, um, he was one of the founders, I believe, of a Taco Bell Club. <laughs> and so um, there is truly something for everyone. And so we're coming close to the end, but before we end, we're gonna answer a few more questions. But before that, um, do any of you have jobs on campus? What is it like to work on campus? Um, have you found it to be helpful? Um, tell us a little bit about that. I'll go first with this one. Um, I have a couple of different jobs on campus. Um, first, my freshman year, I started out as one of the administrative assistants in the Dean's office at HLS. Um, and so I worked at the front desk um, on the fourth floor, which is where the Dean's office is. Um, as a job, I worked there about 10 to 15 hours a week, um, which was really great. And having campus jobs is really awesome because they're always gonna work around your school schedule. Um, and it also means that you're, you might not work on weekends usually if, you, if your job is in an office, which is nice. Um, and IU minimum wage is like $10.15 an hour, which is also great because obviously that's higher than just the normal minimum wage. Um, so campus jobs are a great thing to look into if you're wanting to work while you're in school. Don't feel like you have to, um, but that that's an option. And then now I work as an assistant to Congressman Hamilton um, on the fourth floor as well, right in the dean's office, um, which is a really great opportunity. Um, and that's been really fun just to kind of be able to use what I'm studying to work with him um, and just get to know everybody else in HLS and all of the staff um, and get to know them um, better. And then I also worked as a TA, a teaching assistant for um, a class about nuclear proliferation. Um, so that was kind of different because it's not work as in like getting a paycheck, but it does um, usually give you some class credits, um, which is a really great opportunity. Um, so 
yeah, those are the things that I've done. Oh, and then also obviously as a student ambassador um, for uh, HLS, which has been really amazing, just getting to um, work with incoming students like all of you um, and kind of help guide you guys in what you're looking for and what you're excited about um, and help get you all situated here. So, yeah. Yeah, so um, I am also a student ambassador as we all are. Um, and I also am a research assistant on campus. So um, it's, it's a scholarship, but it's technically, I get a paycheck and I clock in and out. It's um, technically a job. So um, I have done my research in the political science department um, and I've had the opportunity to work both in political theory and in empirical political science. Um, and I've actually just finished um, designing my own survey that's gonna be deployed next summer. Uh, or this summer rather. Um, so that's really exciting. And it's been a really great opportunity um, for me, both academically to get to explore things that I'm interested in and learn about research methods. Um, and I've also learned a lot about myself professionally through that. My professional goals have changed a lot because of these opportunities and um, how much I've found that I love conducting research um, and pursuing knowledge in that way. So um, I definitely think if you have the opportunity to apply for a research job on campus in some capacity, I would highly recommend um, pursuing that as a job on campus. So um, my sophomore year, I worked as a student coordinator for the Office of First Year Experience So um, and for orientation team. So basically I was able to like fit in my work schedule in between my class schedule. So if I had a couple of hours in between classes, I would just head over to the office, get some work done, get paid for the work, and then go off to my classes. And it was nice also working on campus because a lot of the people I work with are also students. So we have a lot that we can like relate on. They're usually close to my age um, and they become some of my really close friends. And then my other job I've had on campus is um, the resident assistant, which is also a very nice job because we get um, our housing paid for. So our room and board as well as laundry and then our food is also covered for. And it's nice because they also work around your schedule. And even though some days it is a heavier load, like it's a schedule that you can manage and customize like based on your school schedule. Yeah, I was an RA as well. And it's a very rewarding experience. It definitely can be busy, um, but from a financial standpoint, it's a um, great benefit as well. It, it covers a, a significant chunk of college attendance cost. Um, thank you all. So now we're gonna go into um, strictly question and answers at time. And we have a few questions already um, waiting to be answered. And so the first question that I have is, um, do any of you know anything about the Peace Corps pr program? Do you have any friends who participated? What's their experience been like? Did you consider participating? Um, anybody fall within that category? No. Nope. So um, Sarah, did you, would you like to jump in on this? I'll let you answer this when you're a little bit more of a pro than I am, so in this area. Absolutely, sorry, just, um, I tried to say something and I realized I too was on mute. So uh, with our Peace Corps prep program, uh, this is an opportunity for students. Sometimes the name can be misleading. Uh, students think that, oh, I have to be uh, wanting to go into the Peace Corps to pursue uh, this certificate. And I know we've thrown around those words. You hear majors, minors and certificates. Um, majors are just what they sound. Minors are smaller versions of majors, typically with less of those uh, fewer uh, what I call uh, additional requirements, so to really round out your studies. And a certificate is essentially a beefy minor. So it has um, a few additional uh, credits that are tagged on to really make sure um, that um, you are becoming a specialist within that area of study. But for students um, going into the Peace Corps prep program, one moment please, so sorry, my screen is freezing. There we go. So sorry about that. Um, everyone's faces froze for just a moment. Uh, the, within this program, you're going to be taking classes looking at um, global development primarily. So a lot of students think that global development has to do with global business, but um, it's also looking at global philanthropy and global trade. Uh, you'll also have the opportunities to take classes that are more within a psychology realm, especially in working within the Peace Corps. You're going to be uh, working with varying populations and we wanna make sure that you're prepared for that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and for that. this one question, we can certainly uh, get you connected. We have our uh, own Peace Corps recruiter on campus who is a part of this program, who I know would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, madam. We have another question. 
And that question comes from Kate Ritter and it is, um, is it hard to become a resident assistant? So to be a resident assistant, you go through a couple of steps. Um, one of them is you just apply um, and you make it through that first round, making sure you make it through the GPA requirements and I think disciplinary requirements. Um, you should be good to take a class and that's a first eight week course. Um, it's heavily based on like different types of theories, um, things that go with like the residential curriculum, making sure you're equipped to um, make these connections with these students as well as become a resource for them. Um, and then after that, you go through an interview process um, and then they try to base you into different residence halls, depending on like your personality or what um, attributes you have and what you can bring to the team, because each residence hall has their own different type of personality. So um, seeing where you would best fit, depending on like the group of students that are there um, and like the personality of the residence hall also. And it's also a rolling process. So even if you don't get like admitted through the first time, they're constantly um, like putting people in the RA position throughout the school year, as well as like in the summer. Thank you, Kiara. We have another question. This one should be fun. Um, what's been your most interesting experience that you've had so far? Um, I feel like this one actually is so hard to answer because I know for like every single one of us, um, we have had so many amazing experiences. Um, but something that I would say is just like something really fun that I always like to tell people is, um, you know, with all of the amazing people that we bring to HLS um, to interact with the students or give lectures and everything like that, I had the opportunity my freshman year to meet the Prime Minister of Estonia and I have a picture with him. Um, and we chatted for a bit. Um, so yeah, that was, I know John and I, I think John, we might be in that picture together. I don't remember. Um, but um, yeah, that was just like a really, just kind of wild moment for me where I was like, wow, yeah, this is where I need to be. Um, but you'll have moments like that all the time. Um, but I would say, um, I don't know, other than that, like one, just getting the opportunity to work with Congressman Hamilton because that man is just like a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and an amazing person. Um, and so if you have the opportunity to sit down with him, he is absolutely willing to. So just ask us and we'll, you know, we'll put you in his office and he'll, he loves to chat with students. Um, and then also I had the opportunity to go to London for an internship last summer and that was probably the opportunity that, you know, I am most grateful for and was um, extremely memorable. So yeah, those are mine. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, I think I agree with Mackenzie. Like there's so many cool things going on on campus all the time um, that you get to meet really cool people. Like at um, the America's Role in the World Conference that we host this year, a lot of us, I think all of us probably met um, Ambassador Marie Ivanovich, who obviously has been a big name um, in the in recently. Um, I also earlier in the year, um, civil rights activist Dolores Huerta was on campus um, and I, so in the research I do, I study civil disobedience and protest tactics and traditions. Um, so not only was I interested sort of as a, you know, American citizen who's grateful for what she fought for, but also you know, in a scholarly way, it was really interesting to be able to listen to her talk. And then on a sort of more um, like day to day, just grateful for IU um, basis, I guess, um, something that w has been really cool for me um, as an in-state student, I think a lot of times IU is sort of seen as um, like a really good school, but almost like mundane. Um, and so we forget that we have all these really cool resources right in our backyard. And I think something that was like kind of the coolest experience that accumulated over time for me, especially during my freshman year, um, was just like the ability to study what I'm studying and talk to the professors I talked to and build those relationships. And I just remember going um, to my research mentor's office hours earlier in the year, and I had just completely switched gears on what my research was like. I wasn't sure that I had the skill set I needed. Um, and I pitched him a project that I wanted to do and we just dove right in um, and it's been going really well. So I think sort of the, just the accumulated experience of all the opportunities I've had at IU accumulating in sort of the professional and academic direction that I want them to is something that, um, you know, is sort of expected in college and can be sort of hard to put into words about why it's so like interesting and 
great that it's happening, but I think that's something that a lot of people will find at IU that they might not have expected to value so much in college. Thank you all. So we have a couple more questions and then we'll close out. Um, one of the questions is, what is the difference or advantage to being a direct admit versus a um, standard admit student? Um, and honestly, the biggest difference is gonna be um, as a direct admit, those students who get an automatic scholarship and as an incoming freshman, um, but in terms of course opportunities and availability and, and those kinds of things, there really isn't much of a difference for the students. Um, I would say the other thing to know is that as a direct admit, you just know going into IU that you're already going to be in the major that you um, elected to be into from the very beginning versus someone who's going through standard admission um, will pursue that major and certify in after their freshman year typically. Um, and the Certify In is pretty straightforward for the Hamilton Luber School and the College of Arts and Sciences. You have to have at least 26 credit hours, some of which can actually come from your high school coursework. Um, you have to have um, the case requirements, which include English composition um, and so on. And so most students pretty automatically fulfill this requirement by their freshman year. And the minimum GPA is a 2.0 GPA. So um, the biggest difference I would say is the scholarship components, but a student who's not directly admitted is in no way at a disadvantage to um, resources and opportunities or anything like that. Um, and so our final question from the question and answer section is, um, what is it like balancing your course load and studying abroad? So it really depends on what program specifically you want to do. Because if you do a study abroad program over a semester, then normally your coursework will be part of the study abroad curriculum. So it'll have built in times for um, you go to classes, you'll have time dedicated to doing homework, you'll have dedicated excursions. Um, normally, normally, the general understanding of study abroad is that the coursework is lessened in order to allow you to enjoy the study abroad opportunity to explore, to travel, stuff like that. Uh, in my case, I was doing a language intensive. So I was doing six to eight hours of Russian language instruction on top of an hour or two of homework every single week. So it really depends on what the program you choose to go, choose to do, as well as um, ensuring that you pick a program that offers courses that will meet a degree, like meet a degree requirement of some kind because there is if you do an international studies degree there is a requirement to study abroad so that may be the requirement that you're meeting but if you're specifically counting on taking courses while you're studying abroad that meet some, a requirement in your degree it's important to make sure that you go to your advisors that you go to all the proper people to check and make sure that the coursework that you do do while there will actually count and this, that also includes language programs, and that can be over academic semester or the summer, like I mentioned. Yep, and there are so many resources for study abroad. So once you get to that point, you will have everything that you need to know to kind of plan accordingly from a finance standpoint, from an academic standpoint. Um, there is an international or overseas studies office on campus, and it's not actually far from HLS. And so you could go there and get support and kind of figure out what you want to do. And there are over 300 different opportunities, some of which are going to be a week long and some of them may be a semester long. And so um, many different ways to um, figure it out. Uh, yep. And so now as we come to a close. All right. <laughs> oh, geez, you mind if I, I get, oh, yeah. One more thing. Um, so study abroad, really, really important. It's a great thing to do. Something that actually the ROTC really is, that's really helpful. They have a program called Project Global Officer. If you sign a contract and join Army ROTC in order to become part of the Army later, they will actually pay you know, like completely for your study abroad program. I went to Latvia for eight weeks and I didn't have to pay a dime because I had already signed that I want to join the Army after college. And because of that, they want to make sure that all of their officers get language instruction and cultural understanding and broadening experiences. And if you're willing to, they're willing to pay for that. So it was very, very helpful in my case, being able to have that completely covered for me. Yeah, thank you, John. So as we come to a close, um, if you all could share, um, you know, why should a student consider HLS and, and ultimately make it, you know, their home? You all probably had, well, I know from experience and talking with several of you that you have many different options to choose from, um, many great options. And so why HLS? Not necessarily why you chose, but now having experienced it, why should someone else consider this um, to be their home for the next four years. 
this is kind of my go-to answer like every single time um, because I've, you know, as I've been an HLS student for a while now and gotten this question so many times, I've just kind of like honed my answer. Um, but I think like the biggest thing is the amount of like individuality that you can have in HLS is just not comparable to, you know, any other place um, that you can go because obviously there's so many places where you can study something like, oops, sorry, international studies um, or different area studies and things like that. But something that's really special about HLS is that there are no two students studying the exact same thing. Every single person here is doing something that fits exactly what they want to do, what they're passionate about and what they're interested in. And all of us have tailored our major, potentially majors and minors and certificates to something very specific that we want to do and even within certain major programs there's different concentrations that you can go down um so it's just really amazing to have like such a big community of fascinating individuals who are all impressive in their own ways who are doing really cool things and so we can all learn from each other um, but there's not really like this environment of competition because everything we're doing is different yeah, I completely agree with that. And something um, that I would that I was not thinking about at all as like a senior in high school that I really value now is the way that the students like engage with each other. So I think peer to peer learning is really underrated. And I think HLS probably, in my opinion, has the most engaging peer to peer learning on campus. I think if you're looking for like a diverse um, group of people as well as a diverse group of topics that you can study, HLS is one of the schools on campus that does provide it. Um, you can study things you never think thought you wouldn't ever study and you can learn languages you never thought of learning because they're all here at HLS. Uh, specifically, the reason why I even I specifically transferred to the school was the language program because I wanted to learn Russian, but for someone who wants to come to HLS, the reason why you should come is because of how flexible they are with allowing you to personalize what you want to study, but also with the amount of depth that you can go into your study. If you want to focus specifically on uh, international business in a particular area using a particular language or languages, you can do that. If you want to focus on a general idea globally, you can do that. If you want to focus only on language study and cultural studies in a particular region or a country, you can do that. Uh, it's all of these different tools in one place that allow you to focus in on something, but also broaden yourself. So you can develop a specialization while at the same time still developing your understanding of the world and all the different layers and networks that are affecting it. Thanks, John. Panelists, student ambassadors, thank you all so much for being on this video chat today. Um, prospective students, we really do appreciate you. I was getting so excited throughout the session because I'm scrolling through seeing the names and I recognize your names either because of a scholarship or because I sent you a letter or because Sarah has connected with you and she's personally told me about you. And so we're super excited to hopefully welcome you to um, IU and the Hamilton Luger School in the fall. Should you all have any follow-up questions or want a more personalized experience, you can reach out to us on our website. We do have a link for you to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one personalized visit where you can connect with faculty, current students who are from backgrounds that you're interested in. You can meet with myself and or Sarah, although I recommend Sarah because she is absolutely amazing at what she does, even better than me. Um, and so if you all need anything, let us know. We're here to help. Um, and we will send this recording out in the coming week or so. Um, but again, thank you all so much and do let us know if you need anything. Have a good one.